How would you like to disappear? Disappear? Go undercover. You know this man? Who's here? I'm here. You're here. These victims are all the same physical type. What about him, Skip? Late 20s, 140, 150 pounds. Dark hair, dark eyes. Have you ever seen him before? I want to send you out there to see if you can attract this guy. How, where? A New York City detective in search of a killer is about to disappear into the night. Is it dangerous? I can't talk about it. How do you know you're gonna end up the same person when it's over? An odyssey to the edge of city life. Bartenders are starting to give me some information. There's this uh, name keeps popping up all the time. There he is, the one with the hat. Is that the one that followed you? Yeah. Why didn't you go with him? I don't know. I think you should check him. If you want to play, I'll play with you. He's the wrong guy. Prince don't match. What he sees. Who's here? What he feels. I don't think I can do the job, Captain. I don't think I can handle it. I'm here. There's just stuff going down. I don't think I can... Uh, I can deal with it. Yes! Yes! You're here. What he experiences. Yes! What he discovers will change his life forever. Al Pacino. Who's here? I'm here. You're here. Cruising. It's seven o'clock. Do you know where your freedom is? Also, THC marshmallows. I know. There's the good, and then there's the very, very bad. (laughs) (laughs) And there's like a fire close by me, too. I can smell it. Like, I'm like, oh, man. Last thing we need is, like, California fires again. Fuck. Fuck. It's (laughs) it's wildfire season, isn't it? Uh, Yeah, we're getting close to it. It actually kind of smelled kind of chemical, and Mm -hmm. the guy who delivered my weed was like, man, I think it's a chemical fire. I don't know if it's a – my God, my God, on top of everything else. That very well could have been the beginning of the show. We can still cut out (laughs) any uh, any (laughs) ramblings that we do, but that could have been the beginning of the show. Ramblers keep on rambling. This is what we always do. We always just ramble on, rambling and rambling. Has it really been <laughs> five months since we've recorded together? That's what my Skype said. Fuck. I think it has been. Mm. How Holy you been? Shit. <laughs> I'm, you know what? I'm a lot better now because I just finally opened the packaging for the new vape that I got. So I'm hey. very happy. I go. <laughs> got my cartridge open. Um, Man, you know, just... I don't know, man. Just getting by, man. I've I've been messing around with uh well I, I kind of did a dumb thing in a smart way. <laughs> I have to hear this. 
Well, it's, uh, you know how I, I've edit. Well, I don't know if you know, but I edit the show in GarageBand. Oh, okay. And I never uh, used that for editing before. It's, it was what I was more used to. Cause I also record m- music and stuff and I have an electric drum kit that you can just plug in or I have a keyboard that I can just plug in and use all the different things and, you know, do MIDI files and stuff. Uh, uh, so I was used to editing in GarageBand, but there's an upgrade called Logic Pro X, <laughs> and it is. I I mean it doesn't it's not cheap, but it's not really expensive. I mean it's how much you might uh, expect uh, upgrade from GarageBand to be, but they have a they have a ninety day free trial. <laughs> nice. When you start that it's kind of in the the assumption that you're gonna buy it at the end uh right because you don't want to go back to the caveman times of just garage band without 700 <laughs> synth plugins and 80 drum sets <laughs> uh but it the the free trial should end the week before my birthday yeah <laughs> And I never know what to ask for because I generally am satisfied with, you know, some DVDs, some comic books, and something to smoke. Right, yeah. (laughs) Same. (laughs) I'm fortunate in that way. But um, it's like, okay. And so I figured out how to hum and turn it into a MIDI file so I can use all those different plugins on it and stuff i I haven't figured out how to do that with a more like if like if i if there was a chord or you know a chord or two or something it has to be pretty simple notes you know what would be amazing because so adam thomas he does this thing where he goes oh shit and it kills me every fucking time like he does this little shoulder shoulder raise when he says it yeah very very sensual about his oh shit (laughs) um i would love to see a remix of his oh shit with you guys you know combining forces (laughs) (laughs) that that would be fun Uh, I (laughs) i went down a youtube hole and found this guy that triggered his drums to you know one video it's like every drum is the snare from metallica's saint anger (laughs) <laughs> One was Gordon Ramsay insults <laughs> and just weird shit like that. Oh, that's amazing. See, that's 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 your that, that should be a project that you work on. I'm just dictating what you work on. <laughs> <laughs> do it. Do it do now. It. Do it. Do it. Yes. It is a f- severe time of scheduling that doesn't really happen with me all that often, but as a, uh, I brought the drummer tendency to be in a bunch of bands with me to podcasting. So, uh, we're we're as we're recording this right now, Vanessa and I are trying to figure out when to do the Pride Month episode of the VD Clinic Pod. Uh, I'm on that summer series, uh, at Podcast Under the Stairs with the top movies of 2000 to 2010, and. Uh, a show with Court and Jerry, the Atomic Age Saucer cast is also. So it's just like, oh, I oh never look at the calendar ever, except for <laughs> when it's especially now when nobody's making a lot of plans outside the house. Right. <laughs> right. Yeah, man. Crazy, crazy times. But at least that gives us time to watch so many fucking good movies. Like the one we're going to talk about today. Yeah, hey, I like that segue. You cruised right into it. (laughs) I sure did. I love some cruising. I can't really say I forgot about this movie, but I really don't think I've seen this movie since college. Oh, really? Yeah. So this must have been cool because it's like rediscovering a film again. Yes. Oh, man. And, And, you know, since we can jump around, there is no structure here. Al Pacino dancing in that black beater. (laughs) Yes. (laughs) With the huffing, huffing rags and, and stuff was 
it just itself worth the price <laughs> yeah. of admission. And, <laughs> and that's not even necessarily the best part of the movie. Oh yeah, I know. It's it's like when you see him dancing so frenetically and then doing all the huffing, it's just like, wow, you went for it, Pacino. I fucking love it. I love it. He just goes for it. And he's supposed to be what mid twenties, but he's something like <laughs> yeah. 30. Definitely doesn't look mid twenties at all. <laughs> it's like I'm big boy Caprice. <laughs> I you know one of my one of the scenes that always freaking cracks me up is when he's first going undercover and then he goes and he looks at the the handkerchiefs and he's asking <laughs> what each one mean with Powers Booth. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I never noticed that before. <laughs> and Ed O'Neill's in this too. I mean, this is a good time to say it. I mean, the cast. So, <sighs> 1980 Cruising with Al Pacino, Paul Sorvino, Karen Allen as one of the three women in the movie. Right. Written and directed Ed-O- by William Friedkin. Yeah, it's it's a stacked cast. Joe Spinell yeah. has a small role. He, uh, what is he, DCC or what is that patrol? D Simone. Yeah, D Simone from uh, the sixth, the sixth pre- precinct. Powers Booth, the hanky salesman. Dude, I I, I wrote down all the things because I knew I would never remember. Oh, let's let's hear it. Okay, so Powers Booth w- has a much better voice than I have, and I might just splice that in, but. <laughs> The blue hanky means blowjob. You have one hanging out of your left pants pocket means you want a blowjob. Blue in the right rear pocket is you give them. The green hanky in your right rear pocket means you're a hustler. The green hanky in your left means you're looking to buy. The yellow hanky in your left rear pocket (laughs) means you give gold and shower. The yellow in the right rear means you receive gold. The red hanky in your left rear pocket means you give S&M. The red in the right... And then what Pacino leaves and it's well are you gonna I'm gonna go home and And think, think about, about it. it. <laughs> <laughs> and he fucking gets the yellow hanky, goes to the club, the leather club the next day, and there's this dude with his his yellow hanky and he comes over and he's like, You into water sports? <laughs> I like to watch. <laughs> <laughs> then take that fucking hanky out of your back pocket. Asshole. <laughs> and, um, so I didn't. I also didn't know before this time around when you brought it up that this movie was heavily protested against during the film. Yeah. So on on the Arrow release, and I believe the documentary is on YouTube. Um, but there's this whole interview with William Friedkin and some of the cast and the crew, and it's a f- really great documentary. I highly recommend checking it out. And um, you know that was one of the things they touched on was that there were a lot of people in the gay community who were really upset because you know this is early '80s, Stonewall was you know had just happened. Yeah, it's like, what, 10 years ago at this point? Yeah. It's still, like, so fresh with people. It's raw. Um, and, of course, you know, the AIDS epidemic would be sweeping across, you know, the gay, the gay community. Um, and so it was like, oh, you know, not a, a movie where it's going to demonize, you know, gay people, which I, I get it. Like, I get the initial response of being like, what the fuck? It's like, oh, man, it's, you know, going to be like this – you know, horror movie, this slasher, whatever, where it's killing gay guys and they're already killing us. I totally get it. You know what I mean? I can get that feeling at that time. Um, but when watching it, it honestly was so authentic because I've been to leather bars like that in San Francisco. I've gone to Folsom Street Fair. I've gone to Dory Alley. If anything, like this film is actually incredibly accurate when it comes to, you know, depicting what it looks like in a leather bar like that for that very specific subset of the gay community. And, you know, even William Friedkin goes out of his way in this documentary to really talk about, yeah, it's based off of a book and we really wanted to focus more on, you know, a specific scene. And they found the scene, the leather community in New York, and we're like, wow, this would be an awesome setup for 
like a thriller of you know this uh, killer going around killing gay men. Um, and I know that there was like another story where they talked about um, it was this these two gay guys. They're black and white. They were actually called the Salt and Pepper Gang um, team up. And they would shake down other gay guys and, um, you know, beat up other gay dudes. And then over time, they started to have murders that surrounded this area um, where these where this leather bar was. Um, so a lot of it's based off of what was happening at that time in New York in that specific community. And I, I don't know. I just found it pure genius. And it, it reminded me of places I've actually been to. And I've seen a lot of that stuff. There's a couple clubs around here. Not really frequented often enough for me to have super clear memories. A friend of mine, John, went all the time, and he loved it. He was he was always just a little weirded out when there would be, you know, a guy laying in the urinal. <laughs> <laughs> you know that that sort of yeah. thing. Just he's like, you know, you you do what you do, but I just want to take a piss. But... <laughs> Once uh, I stopped playing so much live music and going out and drinking most nights, uh, I think I haven't been inside a bar. It was a couple months before the quarantine started. It was the last time I was inside a bar. You know, I can I can see for people who haven't been to bars or clubs like this how this could be shocking. Um, because, like, I, I saw uh, a reviewer um, who reviewed the Blu-ray probably about a year ago. And he was like, wow, this was a really shocking movie. Like, I couldn't believe what I was seeing. But it's also like, you know, he's from, you know, I think somewhere not down south, maybe like, you know, somewhere Midwest. Um, and, you know, he's not gay or doesn't, you know, not exposed to the gay community and, and seeing, you know, specific facets of different subsets within those communities. Um, I can see that being shocking because, you know, it's it's very different. It's a very specific kind of thing that that people are into since we were talking about at the the hankies earlier on when i used to skateboard a lot i would often have a random bandana in my back pocket to wipe sweat or something like that <laughs> and i probably spent 10 15 minutes trying to remember if i had one of those one time when um a bunch of us went to a burlesque show at a place here called wall street which is most, mostly a dance club, uh, but sometimes they would do burlesque and stuff. And there was this one guy that would not leave me alone. <laughs> and, you know, I, I'm a generally pleasant person, so, you know, we just had a lot of conversation, and then they were asking me to go mess around. I was like, oh, you know, thank you, but no. I was actually there with my girlfriend. I was like, this is my girlfriend. A uh, dude went away for a while, and then he came back, and I think the last thing was he grabbed my ass really hard and said, just go with it <laughs> in my ear. God. And I, I really spent like 10, 15 minutes trying to remember if I was throwing out a flag. And I couldn't remember. <laughs> um, oh, my I'm God. I'm glad I didn't get it. I did, glad I didn't get shitty. I just got very stern. But it totally could have been my fault. <laughs> Oh my god. Yeah. I mean I it it, it sounds very familiar to me because I've I've had that happen at gay bars. I've been grabbed and guys being like, Come on, let's go. <laughs> it's like <laughs> sorry, man. I get what well, back before I had my transition, I get mistaken for a boy from the back and I get felt up. I'm like, I'm sorry, honey. <laughs> <laughs> Wrong tree. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> now, according to my brother, I'm like a cute little twink with my top surgery i'm like oh great <laughs> time to go to the gay bars <laughs> wear your mask <laughs> get a straw that you can slip up underneath oh my god that makes me think of another thing that i like about this movie and i, I totally get the the caution with william friedkin going around to bars and he's getting regulars to be extras but he's saying kind of tone down on the sexiness because I don't want to get an X rating, even though I totally did the first however many times that he turned in an edit for the movie. But I feel like inside the movie, it never seems to try to paint someone from the community as a villain, except for the killers. 
You know, right. there's them, there's the dirty cops who make the two people. I couldn't really tell. I wasn't sure either because they kind of struck me as um, transvestites rather than, you know, trans women. At least yeah. that was the sense I got from them. But I don't know. I just didn't want to mis misgender them. But yeah. Um, you know what Joe Spinell and uh, the guy w who was what Frenchie in Summer of Sam or, or uh, uh, Goodfellas and yeah the stepdad in Summer of Sam and among other things like those cops are the bad guys and you know, when <laughs> Paul Servino calls Al Pacino into the office he's like you ever had your cock sucked by a man and like all this stuff and you could tell he's uncomfortable but he's not like i'm gonna fight you he's just like yeah you got the you got the wrong person that's not me uh and he seems to have a genuine friendship with his uh his neighbor i don't know how how, how we wouldn't go about telling the the story of the movie so we can just ramble the rest of the way al pacino is a cop there's a killer going to leather bars and s m clubs killing guys that kind of look like al pacino yeah and you know it's what's so great about this film well i feel like this is such an underrated movie and it has all the makings of like a giallo or an early slasher i was thinking about that too i know yeah. i don't know a lot about giallo but i kind of feel like one of the key signature things is in most cases it's somebody that's not a detective solving a crime you know the, right the fish out of water a foreigner in a strange land, but I feel like Pacino is a cop, but his being the, the traveler in a strange land, that is the 1980 leather scene. Yeah. It's, I mean, it, I feel like a lot of people overlook this movie and it fits so perfectly with the, with the Giallo films from the way that you see, um, you know, the killer's hand and even the knife, the way that it comes down, it feels very giallo, the way that it's shot, um, the dubbing over the vo uh, the voice of the killer, it changes. And you, you notice that the killer is actually different people each time, like you said. Um, even at the end of the movie, the guy's voice is dubbed over with the killer's voice. Which is the uh, voice of his father in his nightmares. Right. And that... Um, that actor was actually that um, that was his drama teacher. They hired him for that role because he and his drama instructor were like they had this kind of uh, father son relationship. And he didn't know he was going to be there until he arrived because um, William Friedkin wanted to bring someone in that was a part of, you know, someone that he felt a connection to. You said Arrow put out the blue. Yeah, they okay. um they it's fantastic. It's so good. There's a lot of great special features. I still want to watch um I haven't watched the director's commentary yet, which that's the next one I want to watch. Um with William Friedkin's um uh you know, voiceover, his commentary on the film, but the documentaries on that are, are fantastic. I only have uh, a digital copy, no special features. As I said, I hadn't seen this movie in so long. I kind of thought that that's all I needed. But yeah, what did you think of it? Like rewatching it again with like fresh eyes. What was your experience like? It was unique in that a lot of, lately I've been watching a lot of movies that I've seen before. And since this was kind of like a, a fresh watch on old eyes or something like that, I made sure I put my phone out of reach, put the movie on and, you know, the, the, like the soundtrack, the germs are on there. I think the germs I don't know if you know the germs. I don't. You know what? I, I don't, but I got to say the music was pretty fucking awesome. I love the soundtrack in this movie. The the one that I know they definitely did was the lion share song. The, like, I want the lion share. Uh, <laughs> what was that when they were going into the peep show, I think? I, I think that might be the one. I think that might be the one, but fast, sloppy seven late 70s early 80s uh punk although they're from la they're not from new york but right. uh i know that they're trying to avoid using too much disco music in the movie so they they had a lot of cool un more underground type stuff and, and i don't know if they talk about this or if this is an urban legend but there was also 
you know that story of the extra in the exorcist right yes the guy who went to he like killed someone right he murdered someone yes he he got convicted of at least one murder but he was slightly suspected in uh the string of a string of murders in the late 70s in new york where uh gay men were getting killed and sometimes cut up i did hear about this so there's like that yeah go on uh so the, there was one of the things when when they were working on because what friedkin had got offered to do this movie before and he turned it down right and then he was talking to his roommate or somebody from the village voice and they were telling him it was like well there's this they think there might be a killer in this scene, and it sort of re-triggered his his interest in the uh, the making of the movie. I never read the book. I, I hear the book. I haven't either. S- sort of part of it is the cop, part of it is the killer, and part of it is uh, like Paul Servino's character. I think. Right. Maybe the Karen yeah. Allen character, but anyway, yeah. Watching the movie, it was. The first time I knowingly was in New York was post 9-11. So I don't really have any memory of old New York. Um, But I've been to New York quite a few times. So every time a a movie takes place in a city that I've been, a little extra, I don't know, familiarity. Right. And I had not been to New York as many times the last time I watched it. You know, I've been mostly around like CBGBs and Brooklyn. Whenever New York is in a film, it always plays such a central role. It's a character in itself. And it the film had that same type of grimy vibe to it that Maniac did. It had that grime to it. And I, I really dug that about this film. And But it was also more elevated from like your typical exploitation film. There was, there was more substance to it. Um, there was a lot of complexity to it because so much of the film leaves you questioning, at least for me, who was the killer or killers? Um, because by the end of the film, I found myself questioning like, well, was it actually Al Pacino the entire time? Was he the one doing this? Um, that's like the questions I start to ask, you know, on multiple rewatches. The last time I tried to see really close who pulled the knife out first at the end? Yeah, it's it's hard to tell because it looks like, at least to me, Pacino's the one that started it. You know what I mean? He puts his – he's pulling his pants down. He steps on him. Dude is pulling out his knife. They show that, but I don't think they show him pulling out his knife, but he's the one that lunges first. Again, you've got a situation of where everybody's sort of expecting to get killed. So is somebody – prematurely acting to defend themselves you never know right and the the overdubbing the overdubbing of the voice one of the things that friedkin had said about this movie is how sometimes a movie changes in the editing room and to say the film ends in an ambiguous way is a slight understatement but i feel like it it wasn't a fuck it i don't even know what kind of story i'm trying to tell i think it was told this way on purpose yeah another thing that i had forgot when i I was talking about uh, friedkin being told stories about the killer in the in the scene in the 70s was uh, this is another thing that could just be rumor but uh, it was going around on people that the killer was doing like a little Sing song, hummy thing, sort of like in the movie, where it's like, "Who's here? I'm here. You're here." <sighs> Something so like creepy. that. So fucking creepy, especially in the the ramble or the bramble. Yeah, dude. Yeah, we okay. We gotta talk about some of the kills because the kills in this are really good and a lot more graphic than I was expecting. Especially that first kill. That was brutal. That was rough to see again for the first time. He's so scared. The sound design on this is really good. You can hear the knife blade flick off the nipple. Mm-hmm. You know, scrape up against it. That little shing. The the powerlessness of that first victim. 
and I, I love how they edited this scene too because as he's being stabbed, the next shot we get is him at the morgue being looked at during the autopsy with Paul Sorvino there talking about what, you know, what just happened to him. And, um, you know, even the way the, the film opened, they find an arm a man's arm just floating in the water. And it's like, well, we don't know who it is. I can't go and hunt down the rest of a body. Cause my, <laughs> my case, I have too many caseloads. So put it with the other unidentified body parts. Oh, on that little tray. Yeah. Fuck, man. I also did not know before this that was actually shot in the in the mortuary. Yeah. The, the the morgue and that dude got fired and then bringing it back to this show, he's that celebrity autopsy guy. Is he really? Yeah. He he's oh, shit. Uh, <laughs> he got he got fired for letting them shoot there. But yeah, he who, who all uh, Phil Spector, Michael Brown, Jeffrey Epstein, and he was recently brought in for the second opinion on George Floyd. Oh, wow. Yeah, that was the uh, well, the chief medical examiner there, uh, Michael Baden. I, the, like, the independent medical examiner, basically, right? Yeah. Yeah, now he's, he's like, Dog the Bounty Hunter, but it's for, Christ. for th- I don't know. A celebrity mortician just seems an odd niche. Yeah, that's that's very niche. <laughs> yeah. Um, and even even the cop in that scene is is a real cop. He's the undercover cop that the book is based off of, and he was also um like one of the cops on the set who they used as like kind of just letting them know like oh yeah this is the kind of stuff that we did this is kind of. The practice that we would do. So he was on set with William Friedkin throughout the film, kind of giving him pointers. It felt very authentic for something yeah. that I don't very, I don't know very well. Yeah, the, the, there's something about it that just it. There's no, there's no sugarcoating anything. He's just showing things as they are. But again, that's like William Friedkin. You know, French Connection is amazing. The Exorcist is a classic, and I think that this is criminally underrated because it is such a well-crafted film that borrows from different genres but has that very realistic feel to it where you feel like you're like a fly on a wall you know watching everything go down they make new york seem inward rather than expansive like a lot of movies tend to do with it right i mean this was sort of by design but you know the clubs were out of the way, nondescript buildings. Be be wary of anyone that you come across on your way there. Yeah, 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 um, yeah. I just the, the the other kill scene that I find really awesome is the one in the the peep show when they're watching the porno and. The killer who walks in there that time is actually the guy who got killed in the previous scene. The first guy that got killed. <laughs> so it's like they use a different person every single time, even someone who's already been killed. Um, and I just found that to be really clever because you just – it literally could be anyone. Yeah, and it throws you off in that subconscious way. But it's always the same voice, always the same voiceover. And I, I wonder if that would have been as strong if they hadn't have had to do so much DR or whatever. Yeah, because of the protests going on, you could hear it. So they had to dub a lot of stuff over because of the cons- constant protest during the film. Which makes it more gialish or however that <laughs> descriptor would be. Yeah. Pronounced. I think I say this on just about every show, but I don't think we've ever covered a movie on here that... I don't like, and that's kind of the point of it, but not to give everything away, but we both really fucking like this movie. And I don't really remember if we introduced you. So if you don't know by, (laughs) by now, if you don't know him by now, (laughs) do a duet. (laughs) (laughs) This is Desmond. Of Desmond's flicks, it's Hello. been a while. Yeah, it's been a it's been a minute, like five months 
ish. Mm-hmm. Yeah, man. You know, I'm happy to be here. It's always fun talking movies with you because we just, you know, we ramble. We we talk and we jump all around. I love that. Um, it's always a good time. It's as if we talk about movies like a couple stoners on the phone. <laughs> exactly. We're just recording our phone conversations. <laughs> it's the party line. Hey, buddy. <laughs> I remember those. Yeah. <laughs> Join the party line. <laughs> Meet local singles like you. <laughs> oh, the kids will never know. The kids that are born in Chaz will never know. <laughs> The weirdness of telephones before the internet existed. Or or when you would – I so we're going way off on a tangent, but now that you brought it up, um, there I, I don't know if you remember these, but there would be like this channel that would show music videos all day long, and you could be able to request a music video by calling a 900 number, and they would play your music video like probably within – an hour, maybe two hours of your call. Um, and I I think I was like seven or eight and I was really into TLC. <laughs> and I ended up calling that phone number and requesting like every single music video by them over and over again. Racked up a bill of like 50 bucks on my, my parents' phone bill. <laughs> you, kids will never understand the horror of having your mom run up to you and be like, what are all these late night calls, this 900 number? I'm sorry I was I was requesting music videos <laughs> at two in the morning during my summer break. <laughs> <laughs> it's like when my dad told me one day, he was like, you know, son, I can see all the websites you go to at night. <laughs> either stop it or learn how to cover your tracks i think might have been what he said oh my god there's things to learn <laughs> oh man yeah i definitely had that happen with the uh, my mom actually was trying to go to buffy.com but she forgot to put the y and uh it was a <laughs> oh, porno Tom. site <laughs> yeah it was a porno site and pop-ups just constantly kept coming up. She's like, oh, no. Oh, no. No, 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 no. Oh, no. <laughs> Told me to leave the room. I can't close up. Like the pile of magazines that Al Pacino finds when he moves into his apartment undercover. Very nice segue, yes. You got to leave the 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 uh, the landlady likes to resell them. Yeah. <laughs> you gotta stack them up nicely, and we meet our our nice uh, our nice buddy down the you know his his neighbor. Um, what was his freaking name? Was his name? S- wasn't Skip? Skip was the guy who got beat up uh, by the cops. Um, oh shoot! Not Ted. No, it's actually Ted. Cause is it Ted? Yeah, he is the uh, the struggling uh, playwright, gay playwright. Who lives with the roommate with the curly like everybody had curly hair in the, in the yeah. 79 80 i guess charlie's angels was popular there's probably a lot of coiffing or however you pronounce that word quaffing <laughs> thought you're thought you're gonna say queefing there's a lot of <laughs> queefing back then i mean i don't know what happened on the set of charlie's angels that might be it was the all the why rage. they do a lot of overdub also <laughs> yeah. it was all the rage on set yeah. back in the day and <laughs> queefing on set Fun fact, the word Fun. queefing was invented on the set of Charlie's Angels. <laughs> By, I don't know. <laughs> By Farrah Fawcett. Queen I'm not saying con- she did it. I'm alleging that she invented the term, and this entire conversation is a work of satire. What had happened was... <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, he, he and he has, that, he has the roommate... Um, Gregory, played by James Remar. He's a very angry person. Dude, he was pissed in his little underwear, answering the door, being like, what the fuck are you doing here? (laughs) I kind of feel like they had a bit of a... Well, one reading, I guess, is he's a very protective older brother type, looking out for his sort of timid little one, or he's kind of a jealous boyfriend. Yeah, it's... 
it's hard to tell because the way that Al Pacino's character is presented in the at the beginning of the film, in the beginning. <laughs> In the beginning, Al Pacino <laughs> was given a motorcycle, uh, or a, a biker hat, and he chose, like, the worst, I, well, I don't know about the worst, but one of the harder bandana colors to fake your way through. You know, right. you, you, I feel like you could probably half-ass doing some BDSM, but, you, I mean, Golden Showers is like, you've got to be into it. Right. Like, I don't know. It seems like you could fake your way through enjoying other things easier. But I guess maybe that's – I'm not. Remember, he likes to watch. Yeah, I like <laughs> to watch. <laughs> He's so adorable in his little leather costume. <laughs> He's so tiny. He's adorable. Well, did you notice – I think there was one scene near the end where he's walking with that college kid. And they've totally got him walking up on the the hill of dirt next to the sidewalk. Yeah. When they're walking next to each other just to and I give mean, him a what? little bit of height. How, how, he's not super short, but. I, I feel like I've seen that he's like. Five, seven. Five. OK, so he's average height. Yeah. Joe Pesci is five, four. I'm taller than Joe Pesci. Dude, I'm as tall as Joe Pesci. <laughs> but Joe Pesci's awesome. Yeah, so Joe Pesci's okay. pretty sweet. I don't know why they're showing me all these other people. And there's Leonardo DiCaprio. For some reason, when you look up how tall Al Pacino is, they give. <laughs> I guess here's it's... someone taller. Wait, have you you've not seen Once Upon a Time in Hollywood yet? Have you? I have, and I loved it. Uh, okay, maybe that's why they're they're linked. Oh yeah, that's right. I forgot Pacino had like a small role in that movie. Yep, Schwarz. I gotta watch that again. It's such a good movie. First, you gotta watch um, Knives Out if you haven't seen it yet. Uh, I just I just listened yeah. to your your episode on the horror returns. <laughs> it reminded me that you said you haven't seen it. I know I outed myself. <gasps> I haven't seen it yet. For shame. Do that um, with your vape pen later. Okay, I'm. You know what? I'm I'm in. Done. Done and done. I'm gonna do it tonight just for you. <laughs> <laughs> either that or idle hands if i haven't seen that either so yeah, yeah. idle I'm hands might fit better with the vape pen good vape pairing mid podcast vape pairing recommendation that we'll try to randomly throw out in episodes <laughs> uh, but speaking of throwing out we were talking about al pacino throwing out porn magazines and meeting yes. his roommate or his neighbor with the asshole or justifiably angry boyfriend person and he's sort of teaching him the ropes and he's he's like his first contact and it's very nice young playwright it's not really his scene the leather bars are not really his his thing and what you said one of your favorite kills was that opening one that first kill was brutal that's probably the best one out of the film i think and the peep show one was really good the peep show one was good i'm pretty sure that's the scene where the germs are playing and you get the the clue, you get the fingerprint. Um, there's the fucked up interrogation, dude. And then the the big dude that comes in and starts slapping them around. Yeah, he's just in a jock strap and a cowboy hat. And the cop that was on you know on the set, kind of letting them know what was happening. He's like, yeah, that actually happened. <laughs> I've seen that happen. Maybe that's why they did it. But did he say it was because? That way, when someone tells you that it happened, that you think they're just totally lying. Uh, yeah, right. Like, it, the, yeah, the, it could be the like, cops dragged this. me in. They didn't read me my rights. They were threatening to hurt me, float my balls in in a in a thing of water, and then this giant black dude in a cowboy hat and jock strap came in and just punched me in the face and didn't say anything, and he left the room. <laughs> okay, Huff some sure, more dude. handkerchiefs with uh with Pacino. On the dance floor. And it's like, it's fucked up, but it's also kind of funny because each time it happens, both guys go, who is that guy? <laughs> who is that guy? Who is he? <laughs> and like, it's fucked up, but it's also really funny. Like, what the fuck? <laughs> um, and like, even Al Pacino at one point grabs the dude's hat and throws it out the window. 
when yeah. he comes out. You really got me there. <laughs> Fucker. Yeah, they just wail on this dude and they make him take down his pants. And it all turns out that he had nothing to do with anything. He was totally clean. And they just beat the crap out of that poor kid for no reason. Just for being gay, basically. Um, and they try to pass it off onto Al Pacino's character being like, well, you fingered him. He's like, yeah, I fingered him. But just because I said that's the guy that I talked to doesn't mean that you can rough him up. And there's this dropped line that I really you know, felt was important that they dropped in there was Al Pacino saying, you know, I don't want to – paraphrasing, I don't want to use – what I'm doing as a way to basically beat up gay, gay guys. Like, that's not what I signed up for. So he's like, I didn't sign up to be gay bashing people. Yeah. I signed up to find a killer. And this is like really fucking me up. It's fucking up my head. Because, you know, when we can get into those deeper reasons, because there's a lot of questions about, you know, Al Pacino's character and, you know, if, if he goes both ways. By the end, he was at least fluent in the 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 lead up, you know, because what yeah. you know, like on party size. Which okay, when you hear party size, <laughs> do you think that's like teeny tiny like trick or treat candies or party size, like a six foot sub or <laughs> a half a candy bar? <laughs> I I I guess my thought when I heard party size is like. He's a little bit smaller, so he's easier to pass around. Party size. There we Have go. Have a good time. Okay. That's that. At least my reading of it. Yeah, it it was just something I was curious about. Uh, <laughs> most of the other things seemed relatively self-explanatory. You know, hips or lips. Um, I want to see the world. Yeah, I want to see the world. Oh, I don't go anywhere. The party size was like, okay, that could that could go two ways. But yeah, right. it, <laughs> he says it's changing him. If he is the killer, did he kill his uh, neighbor friend? Right. That leaves a lot of questions. It's like it could be either him or his boyfriend who's now back out on the streets like cruising again for, for dudes to kill. A good watch. Yeah, I don't think you're supposed to figure it out. I just think you're supposed to think about it Yeah, when you're watching it. And yeah, I, I know the critical response to it has been sort of coming back on – a lot of people saying that this is a big, a good representation, uh, or at least if there's any negative connotation, it's never implied or on purpose. It's just right. uh, ignorantly there. Um, I, I didn't look up. I sort of stopped looking up what things are rated on Rotten Tomatoes. Yeah. But it seems like at least, well, again, when you're dealing with narrators and what's a reliable and what's an unreliable narrator, I feel like Friedkin always said that he had the best intentions when making the movie. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, and, you know, although I'm not a gay man, I am a trans man. So it's like being a part of the LGBT community, it was for me personally watching it, there was never a point where I felt like it was doing a disservice to the gay community. It just showed a snapshot of a very specific, um, you know, uh, subset of the community that's into leather. And if you've ever been to Folsom Street Fair or Dory Alley in San Francisco or any leather gay bar, it's basically that's shown on film. It's quite toned down compared to what you see in real life but it's still like it's still really raw like it's explicit still still a very explicit film um but i love that about this film because they go there they really want to show it in its authenticity and there's never a point where they show it in a way to make it like look how disgusting this is it's not it's just shown as this is just showing you what it is um, and even Al Pacino's character, he's like a blank slate, taking it all in. He doesn't seem shocked. He's just like, okay, just looking around, kind of taking it in. Um, and I appreciated that because it's like 
yeah, there's no clutch your pearls moment. Like, oh my God. <laughs> <laughs> oh shit. Uh, <laughs> as Adam Thomas would say, oh shit. Um, but you know, that that's what I like about the film is how authentic it is and how it doesn't try to pick, you know, a certain angle of showing kind of some, some kind of morality story of some kind. It's just, it is what it is. And I like that. I like the bouncer who, uh, when he was there out of sorts on precinct night. Oh yeah. I liked how a lot of the time the marginalized communities have to sort of police themselves and take care of themselves. Mm -hmm. And the, you know, like you a cop. Why? You know, just like, okay, <laughs> you're not dressed up. You're not right. You need to get out of here. And, uh, you know, another, I don't want to make him like the hero of this movie because he could be a killer of at least one person or, you know, well, I don't want to say at least one person. He could be a killer. The person we yeah. know that he stabbed lived. And that was another thing that I feel like was done on purpose for the Pacino character was he didn't try to fight the bouncer or make it a point to get revenge on them. You know, he just left. A lot of the movie is him trying to fine tune his acclamation. Right. And I don't know where it's going to go from there. I mean, he brings his leather and his hat back to Karen Allen's house at the end. He does shave, but I feel like he never really had much stubble in the in the thing. I don't know why, why they made such a big point about him shaving except for the the mirror shot. Yeah, it's and and you know Karen Allen putting on his it basically like a costume. Like, mm -hmm. ooh. Put this on. Um just like he would. You know what I mean? This is all an act. This is a costume that he's putting on. Um just like she did like something to get kinky with, maybe. <laughs> yeah, I, 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 I like the choice. I mean, she's a great actress anyway. Yeah. But I like the choice of only giving her the script that had her scenes in it. So she really was in the dark about everything that wasn't her scene, just like her character is. Right. It works so well. It's so authentic. And, and I really like the way that Pacino interacts with her because there's so many films where he gets so fucking pissed and he starts screaming at someone. Um, <laughs> and he's what a lot more. That? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and he's a lot more subdued in this movie. He's toned down a lot. And I really like that. You know, it's a more chilled out Pacino, a lot more of like, I, I would almost say like looking inward and analyzing things around him and kind of soaking it in. Um, but I also wanted to piggyback on what you were saying about um, Karen Allen was whenever he almost has some type of uh, sexual activity with another man, he'll be like, oh, no, I got to go. And he leaves and he goes straight to his girlfriend's house to have sex with her. Um, and, you know, there's like this one scene where he's having sex with her and you can see her face and it's like, there's this look on her face where, like, yeah, she's enjoying having sex with him, but there's, like, this look of, like, okay, this is different. Like, there's yeah. something different about him. Yeah. Like, are, are you – yeah. Where are you or – Who are you? <laughs> yeah. It's all of those little subtle things that make this film so brilliant. It, it was even a – was it that scene or was it a separate scene where he closed his eyes and he was hearing the music from the club? Oh, while she's uh, going down on him? Yeah. Yeah. It's like, okay, is he like picturing one of the guys there? Yeah, the guy with the greasy that, arm? That... Who knows? <laughs> he looks at him He a lot. was, yeah, he was uh, watching intently as that one dude got fisted. <laughs> Which is apparently that and a, a lot of other things that are the 40, 40 cutout minutes, right? Yeah, you know, and I, I haven't seen um, the movie or like the video based off of this, but um, James Franco did like a short movie of those like 40 minutes that were cut out of that film as like his own little thing and recreating all of it. 
I've heard it's pretty good. I had only heard it mentioned briefly in looking up articles about the movie when I was looking at the, the critical reception. Which was scathing at the time. It It didn't do well with critics. Like, I think both Roger and Ebert didn't like it, I believe. Oh, Siskel and Ebert? Yeah. Ebert didn't like many horror movies. Yeah. Didn't make a whole lot of money. Yeah, it only made $19 million off of an $11 million budget. So it made back, probably made back like some of its marketing budget. And then that was pretty much it. <laughs> it's why Al Pacino had to make, what, eight movies between then and 1990. After Cruising, there was Author, Author, Scarface, Revolution, Sea of Love, Dick Tracy, and The Godfather Part Three. Oh, yeah, there's like one really good movie in there. <laughs> <laughs> and, and that would know, be Scarface. <laughs> I will still watch Dick Tracy, though. I won't say it's a great movie, but I will still watch Dick, Dick Tracy. I haven't watched that in years. The movie freaked me out. Oh, man. But, you know, it, it, it's cool seeing Pacino in a film like this because, it you know, I, it's a risky role to take at that point in his career. In the in the in the early eighties, eventually he became the guy that played Al Pacino in movies. I feel mm-hmm. like he didn't have. I mean, what Son of a Woman? The last time before it was okay. Well, there here's Al Pacino as he. I feel like here's it. Al yeah. Pacino as the Devil's Advocate. I mean, he's made made a lot of great movies, but I kind of feel like he had it at that Pacino impression level after. <laughs> Not too far after this movie came out. And yeah. It, but then he throws out the stuff like he was also chill in Once Upon a Time in Hollywood. And that's usually like when I really like Al Pacino is when he's more restrained and just doesn't do all – doesn't constantly yell. Although I love that too. Like it, it can be awesome or hilarious, one of the two. Um, But you know, with, with this film, it's like – Again, it's like there's that restrained type of aspect to his character. There's a lot of him where you can just tell that he's thinking about his next move. Um, And then there's even like, you know, some of the physicality he does, not only with the amazing dance scene, which has to be seen to be believed, um, but his like little workout uh, routine that he does to get pumped up. And he's like screaming, going, yeah. (laughs) <laughs> yeah <laughs> like it's just there's so many different facets to his character that I, I feel like we haven't really seen from him very much since like you were saying since this film and a few more later films still great movies <laughs> i mean he's a literal cartoon character in dick tracy fucking pacino i know what friedkin still kind of wishes that he had richard gear but he didn't get he stopped being so salty about his initial <laughs> response to Pacino's depiction. So can you tell me? I I don't recall much of that. Can you go over some of the Richard Gere stuff? I it really it was just when they were before they offered it to Pacino. It was an interview with a guy that interviewed Freakin. <laughs> Got it. But uh, he had he had wanted Richard Gear because he thought I mean he looked a little prettier and he had a little bit more androgyny to, to his, uh, his presence. I think he's also younger, a little younger than Pacino. I think they also considered pretty sure they, they considered the guy that played chief Brody and jaws. I I can't see that at all. I can't see that either. I, I, I mean, it's hard to see somebody beside, besides Pacino doing it just because, I mean, this is 1980 Al Pacino. Yeah, I mean, I I could kind of see Richard Gere, but I also feel like at least at that time in his career, he didn't quite have that like sense of uh, what's it trying to think of the right word Um, kind of danger, you know, like Pacino. He's so you don't know what what you're going to get with him. And you feel like he can explode at any point. 
And there's a few points in this film where it seems like he's going to explode on someone. Um, but he doesn't. He holds back that restraint. And I don't know if Richard Gere could be able to really get that, you know? He would have worked from that physical standpoint and, you know, really being that pretty boy. But I feel like it works so much better with Pacino. He just – he looks like, you know, just kind of your average Italian guy, you know? I'm much less of a fan of Richard Gere than I am of Pacino, but – Right, yeah. I, think I mean, that's, it's Pacino. <laughs> yeah, it's Pacino. Well, largely is because I kind of feel like I've never seen a movie, maybe an officer and a gentleman, where I thought Richard Gere showed any range. Mm-hmm. Really, I mean, he gets kind of louder, but not even interesting louder. Like when Pacino gets pissed and just goes off, you're like, oh, God, he's going to throw a chair, maybe. I don't, I don't <laughs> yeah. really know what this character is going to do when he's mad. I kind of feel like Richard Gere would slap you. It just seemed like non-threatening no matter how angry he yeah. got mad. It's just too soft. You yeah. That kind of hard edge to it. And, you know... It, Pacino comes across as like, you know, the, the the dude that would, you know, live down the block and he could just fit in. And he did like he was able to just kind of slip right in. Whereas, you know, someone like a Richard Gere, again, like we like we both said, it's just he's too pretty. And his, his eyes are too kind. He's got he's got very kind eyes, if I remember. <laughs> And I, I, I can't I can't really see him being like, all right, hips or lips. And being like, <laughs> I want to see the world. Because <laughs> I've got no place else to go. <laughs> right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I can't sing the praises enough about this movie. And I, I just recently watched this for the very first time, like probably about a month ago. Um, and then I immediately bought the Arrow release after I watched it the first time. Um, and by the way, the Arrow release is like, I think it's a 4k scan is gorgeous. It looks like a whole new movie. Um, but yeah, the, the acting, the story, the pacing, casting music and, you know, the overall atmosphere and the blood and, and giallo type of influence it has. It really makes Cruising a very unique film and very different from other films that had come out during that time. And there's like this real sense of Friedkin wanting to be able to be as authentic as possible, as well as like getting people that were kind of genre specific, like Joe Spinell. Of course, this is before he did Maniac, but you know, you know what you're getting with Joe Spinell, you know, and there's that seedy kind of grimy feel to him in a lot of films. Um, and that just is, you know, a, a microcosm of what this film is. It's feels sleazy. It feels grimy. I feel like when they're walking around in the city in the middle of the day and they're wearing shorts or an open T-shirt, I can feel that humidity in New York. Where it's just like everything is sticky. Your pants are sticking to you. And I'm like, oh, I can feel that. I can feel that, you know, that late night, you know, one in the morning New York heat where you're constantly sticky and it's so gross. But, you know, you're wanting to, you know, walking or walking around late at night in New York. That's what it, it, it just felt so authentic to me. You picked this pretty quick when t- deciding on, on, on what to do. <laughs> It was was there any other doubt or was just as soon as I said, hey, let's do a show, you're like cruising? Yeah, I – having like watched it twice at that point when we talked about it, I was just like, dude, we got to talk about cruising because it's just – it's so underrated. It's one that gets overlooked and I feel like this film deserves a lot more love. Um, and it makes me want to go back and watch – William Friedkin's other films, like I want to go and rewatch The French Connection, which is an amazing film. It's what made Gene Hackman Gene Hackman. Um, and the same, and I rewatched The Exorcist pretty recently, and that film I think is is still incredible. Um, and this is just yet another one that is both really well done, but also just feels very authentic. Um, and the way that he did The Exorcist, where it's like it makes it feel, even though 
this is something that has to do with demons and religion, he still made that film feel down to earth and relatable in a way. Did the same thing with cruising. Um, you were able to, you know, relate in some way to Al Pacino's character kind of just being plucked out of his normal life and dropped into this totally different world that he knows nothing about. And I just, I found that to be such a fascinating topic to talk about. Yeah, there's a college student haunted by the idea of his father. There's, yeah, I'll let you know, there's Paul Sorvino, old school, gray-haired cop. Probably did some shitty shit, but he seems like he's trying to be an okay guy now. You know, when he is talking to Joe Spinell at the murder scene, and he gets his name, puts it together with Six Precinct, and he's remembering what he totally copped at his yep. informant about you know don't come around here saying crazy shit about cops abusing their power <sighs> give me a yeah. name keep your mouth shut and, it's just, and then he just it clicks uh the the playwright down the hall yeah ted he's ted. he's the most innocent out of all of them he was collateral damage i felt so like that was the one character where i felt really bad because it was like this guy's just trying to get by. He's trying to make it as a playwright. I mean, he's doing what he's got to do. You know, there's that point where he's talking to Pacino and he's just like, yeah, you know, my roommate's coming back. And we got to, he said, I have to go and pull my weight. So, you know, I'm probably going to have to like give a couple blowjobs and stuff like that to make a little more, a little extra money for rent or whatever. And Pacino was like, I wish I could help you, man, you know. And there's like this moment where it almost feels like maybe they were either having a relationship or had a very close friendship. And, you know, even Paul Servino, you know, putting it together that Pacino was just down the hall from this kid who got murdered. And, you know, just kind of that recollection, you know, you see that on his face, on Paul, Paul Servino's face where he's just like, what the fuck are we doing? <laughs> like... Who's the guy that's in the hospital bed? Who's even the cop that was undercover? Like, who am I? What are we doing? It's still happening. Um, and it's just such a perfect ending to such a sad film. And it's a really downer ending. Yeah, we got the, the self-reflective moment in the mirror, shaving with Pacino. And then it's just back to the water and the boats. Sort of like how it all started. Yeah yeah I, just, I i love that about this film and i love this movie and i'm 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 so happy that we talked about it because it is like i i feel like it's such a classic and it's it's one that i feel like is not only great in terms of like showing a specific community at that time in new york but it's also like i feel like this is a really good film to watch if you're into giallo or slashers because it has that murder mystery giallo type of aesthetic to it with like top tier talent <laughs> yeah i think that's why i i never really thought about considering this a movie that was underappreciated i just kind of assumed that everybody th that more and more people were talking about it because of all the names involved and the time you know, it was 10 years or 11 years after Stonewall, directed and written by William Friedkin. You got Powers Booth and Al Pacino and Karen Allen and all these other people. I, I don't think until I saw people talking about how it was underrated. Okay. Doesn't make sense to me, but I guess I'll, I'll believe that. I mean, I guess that's why they have the term hidden gem. Yeah. I, I feel like the film just got overshadowed by the controversy that surrounded it and people more so remember, remember like the protests and the controversy rather than the actual film. And I, I, I feel like this is one that should absolutely be rediscovered by, you know, film fans. And the, like I said, especially Giallo and Slasher fans, because it's it's totally a Giallo in my mind. That's how I would describe it, but I, I, again, being so unversed in the genre, I mean, I've seen quite a few of the movies, but I couldn't really speak intelligently about the intricacies of it. I had made a note to 
ask you if you hadn't brought it up, uh, if if you considered it giallo or giallo like. And you you know like I feel like Duncan McLeish would be like the perfect <laughs> giallo aficionado to come on and be like, ah yes, here are the <laughs> here are the correlations to this this and this film. I got I got my got my lesson on Giallo back in January from him. It was great. <laughs> oh right, back on Desmond's flicks. Yeah, <laughs> That's, that is correct, sir. <laughs> I mentioned it to him the other day. I I believe the list. Yeah, the list is already out, so I can say we were talking about uh, frailty. Oh, the... I still ha- I still haven't seen that. Oh, for real? Yeah, I gotta watch that movie. Yes. Sometimes, well, I, I I think it's a really good movie, but also sometimes if you've watched it the second time, it gets that extra ah to mm-hmm. it. But uh, Powers Booth is in that, so I had uh-huh. mentioned that I had sort of a accidental Powers Booth double feature the other <laughs> night because I had no recollection of him being in this movie, and after I watched Frailty for that conversation, I watched this. We didn't talk about it much because we weren't there to talk about it, but he seemed to appreciate the film. Well, he has amazing taste in movies. <laughs> I think we've ac- accidentally ended the show already or wrapped the I show up. I think we did, as, as per usual. <laughs> as as per usual, we're, we're, we talked. It was like the trip took no time. We talked the whole way, and all of a sudden we're here at the end of another psychosemantic podcast after another psychosemantic cast. I don't really know which one sounds better. I usually just say psychosemantic. I like uh, that better personally. Psychosemantic? Personally. I, that's how I call it too. <laughs> but anyway, <laughs> this should be out in the next week or two. You got anything to add right now? Come and check out my YouTube channel, folks. Desmond's Flicks over on YouTube. I'm actually working on a review for Attack the Block. Uh, wow, that, that was a first time watch. That was a cool freaking movie, and that it was, was a uh, first time watch. I can't wait to yeah. hear about that. Have you already recorded that? I'm gonna be recording it um, either tonight or tomorrow. Um, and it's uh, it was a request from one of my patrons. Uh, there was a tier on my Patreon where you can request a movie review, um, and I review that movie you re- you requested. And he requested. Um, Attack the Block, which I was excited about. Like, sweet, movie I haven't seen yet. And it has John Boyega in it. And I love John Boyega. So uh, I'm into it. Finn, all right? Yeah. Like, uh, among yeah. other things. Among other things and just being a freaking badass dude. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that guy is awesome. Not being I got so much about respect what uh, Papa Mouse thinks about him going out to protest. Yep. I love that. I love that. Uh, <laughs> you, can't, you can't do that. <laughs> <laughs> we're so powerful we're still afraid of people <laughs> that that actually reminds me of um you know the, I, I was watching who framed roger rabbit yesterday for uh the horror returns and um man mickey mouse is in there with bugs bunny like oh <laughs> you could get killed <laughs> Yeah. Which, uh, that movie is still fucking awesome. I love that movie. Anyways, I, I digress. <laughs> I watch that movie at least once a year. <laughs> I, I hadn't seen that in no joke in probably like 20 years. And it was it was a great revisit. What a fun movie. I love that movie so much. But um, but yeah, Desmond's Flicks. I'll have Attack the Block up probably by the time it, this comes out. Um, I just did my top 10 of the 2010s uh, for horror films which was so much fun. It was fun going back and, and looking at all the fantastic films from the 2010s. And the next list is going to be the top 10 of the 2000s. So something those two to look forward to over the next coming weeks. Thank you so much. I, I'm glad that we we got to get together again. Uh, Absolutely, it. man. It's yeah. it's always fun. Thank, thank you for having me. Cruising, I'm glad you picked it. I don't know when I would have got around to just watching it randomly. A good summer movie. Oh, yeah. I would say that. Good summer movie. It's a thriller, giallo, horror, slasher type movie. Any of those, float your boat. Get some leather. I'll turn off the lights. Watch oh, cruising. shit. Yeah. <laughs> go to Wild Man's Leather and Lace, where I used to go get all my spike bracelets. <laughs> uh... <laughs> 
or you know, or I guess more modern time, if you're in Columbus, go to the garden and the chamber. Don't forget to duck and cover, everybody. Five months until the election in the states. Oh my god. Other things. <sighs> Holy shit. <laughs> Happy Pride. Defund the police. Black Lives Matter. Fucking damn the man. Save the empire. Or or let it burn. Fucking A, man. This is Bo from legionpodcasts.com. Hey, it's been a crazy time, and when the world gets nuts, we're happy to offer some old-fashioned podcast entertainment. But for some folks, getting a laugh out of a show isn't really helping these days. People who depend on tips in their bartending jobs or have been put on furlough with no pay till the worst of this coronavirus threat has passed. That's a tough spot. That's why we set up a GoFundMe for members of our community, a sort of grand-scale take-a-penny-leave-a-penny. For people like myself, for whom the recent disruptions haven't kicked us out of work, well, we can drop a few of those extra pennies in the GoFundMe jar for those who are directly affected by recent events and find themselves looking for money to pay the electric bill or keep the water on. Well, how about you give me a shout at bo, B-O, at legionpodcasts.com. Let me know the situation and what you need, and we'll do our best to make life a little easier. And you can find links to the GoFundMe on the front page of legionpodcasts.com, on our Facebook group page, or on Twitter at Legion Podcasts, where it's the pinned tweet. For those of you who are able, thanks in advance for chipping in. And members of our community who need a hand, hey, here we are. Remember, stay safe, stay healthy, and we're all going to get through this together. Legion isn't just a name, it's who we are. Thanks for listening to all the shows here on Legion Podcasts, and we'll talk to you soon.